Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is David Henderson, a research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution and an associate professor of economics at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He's the author of The Joy of Freedom, a wonderful book on the economics of various policy issues, and he's the editor of the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics at the Library of Economics and Liberty that is available in print and online, and it's being revised and should be available, the revision, in December of 2007. David, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. What I want to talk with you about today, David, is the idea that, that there's a, a core set of views that economists hold, a consensus toward a wide variety of issues, and whether that's true or not, whether economists basically agree or basically disagree. Are we uh, a real science with a, a set of established truths, or are we a little bit uh, less reliable than that? I want to start with a common joke, which I hate. You probably, you probably hate it too, uh, which is that if you took all the economists in the world and you laid them end to end, they still wouldn't reach a conclusion. And I'd add the, uh, I think it was the Truman line. He's looking for the one-handed economist yes. who won't always be hedging and saying, on the other hand. And these kind of, this sort of folk wisdom, humor, whatever you want to call it, I think leads people to conclude and is based on a view that economists uh, don't really agree on anything. It's anything goes in economics. And is, do you think that's true? No, I don't. And in fact, that's why I also hate the joke. It's true that people, that economists have different values often, but they often share the same views on analysis. So for example, on rent control, the vast majority of economists agree that if you keep rents down by law, You'll have a shortage of apartments. It'll be hard for people to find apartments. Apartments will slowly deteriorate over time. In and quality. Less in quality. If you, have a special exempt, if you don't have a special exemption for new construction, it's going to be hard to get new construction because people are going to know that that will be controlled also. So all those things are things economists realize. And this, the left-wing, relatively left-wing Swedish economist, Asser Lindbeck, uh, was of that view. In fact, he once said that the most... The, the, the most effective way to destroy a city other than bombing is with rent control. So there's an example where there's a wide range of agreement. And the way I've put it to my students is, it's very hard to find an economist who doesn't live in a rent-controlled apartment who will favor rent control. Now right there I kind of mix two issues. I said they agree in the analysis but not necessarily in the values. So you could agree that rent control has these bad effects I talked about and still favor rent control because of other effects. Maybe you think it helps a certain group of people you want helped. Uh, but, but I'm saying even it's more strong in the rent control issue at least. Not only do economists agree that rent control destroys housing, but they also agree that it's a bad idea. So where does the view come from that there's all this disagreement in economics and that economists are, are not real scientists? From two, area, two, two things, I think. One is economists, when they get together, aren't going to bother spending a lot of time talking about what they agree about. So if you went into a room and said, rent control destroys housing, and, and, or let's say you said that in a, in, in a session at the American Economic Association, People in the audience would go, duh. Right. It, you know, it's it's like, tell us something we don't know. Uh, and so you're going to tend to find the discussions about things people disagree about. That's the first thing. The second thing is most of what people think they know about economics, they get from the media. And let's say you're a trained reporter, but you haven't really taken much economics, or if you did, you thought it was about a bunch of charts and graphs and something called perfect competition, and that was it. So this media reporter is supposed to do this story on free trade. So he gets an economist who says, yes, free trade is a good idea. Well, he wants balance. So if John Culbertson of the University of Wisconsin is out that day, he's not going to find balance. That's the main economist I know of. He died a couple of years ago, but that was the main economist I knew of who explicitly said free trade was a bad idea. 
So what's this reporter going to do for balance? This reporter is going to call up something like the National Association of Manufacturers, the AFL-CIO. And even there, it might be fine to, hard to find an economist who will unambiguously say free trade is bad. And so the person will work his or her way to someone in the organization who will say it's bad. And that's not necessarily hard to find. And then what will the headline be? Economists disagree. But we didn't even have one economist versus another. We had one economist versus essentially a lobbyist. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think uh, there's another distinction you can make between an academic economist and a think tank economist. Yes. Y you can find academic economists who, who question trade, certainly. They may not be anti-free trade, but they question uh, the virtues of free trade. Or they might be willing to put on some forms of protectionism. But you're more likely to find those folks in think tanks where they're called economists, they have economics degrees, uh, but they are grinding an axe of one sort or another on either side of the, of the political spectrum. I, I want to come back to trade labor. Let's just stick with this general issue okay. of the source of the disagreement, uh, why, the, excuse me, the source of the perception that economists don't agree. Don't agree. So you've made a couple of nice examples. Another point I know you've made in the past is the distinction between micro and macro, yes. microeconomics and macroeconomics. So a lot of people take one course in college called economics that's macroeconomics, which is about how the overall economy performs. Issues such as interest rates, the business cycle, unemployment, inflation, those issues fall under macroeconomics. And there, there is more disagreement. There is. That's right. And, and that is a good distinction. That in macro, you're going to find much more disagreement typically than in micro. Issues are much less settled. We're less sure. And so there, there just is more ground, there are more grounds for disagreement. In micro, that's where more issues are settled, like rent control. And free trade, really, when we show to our students and so on the little graphs that show that it's good, we're using essentially micro graphs. We start with two people on an island, you know, and, and just build from there. And so, yeah, I think the, a lot of the disagreement is in macro. I, I want to come to, let's stick with macro for a minute because I really hadn't thought about this. Uh, I think that is the general perception that if you do narrow it to micro and macro, a perception in the in the profession, not now, yes. I'm not talking about among among the general public. In the right. profession, most economists would say there's a lot more agreement and consensus in micro about the analytics yes. than there is in macro about the analytics. Having said that, when I think about it a little bit more, I'm not even sure that's true. Um, when I was in graduate school uh, in the late 70s, we were close to a consensus on what causes inflation, and I'd say we're at that consensus now. That, that is true. Uh, and before that, there was, when I was an undergraduate, there were these different theories of inflation. There was cost push and demand pull and labor unions, and Milton Friedman, uh, as we talked about in an earlier podcast, uh, Milton Friedman said, no, inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Yes. That is, too much money chasing too few goods yes. is what causes steady and regular increases in the price level. That debate's up pretty much over. You're right. That, that is a good example of where the disagreement is narrowed substantially. And related to that, if you tra one way to track the way the profession has moved is to see the way Paul Samuelson's textbook has moved. <laughs> uh -huh. And I did this in an article once in Fortune magazine where I pointed out what he said about monetary policy in the early 50s, completely ineffective. And as Milton Friedman gained influence in the economics profession, Samuelson's textbook changed on that to where by the 1980s he was saying fiscal policy is relatively ineffective, monetary policy is much more potent. Now, the, the risk... Of, of this analysis is that we're looking at a cycle and we're immersed in one piece of it. Yeah, and this is, right. a, this is an intellectual fad, monetarism. And I don't think it is in this case, but if we looked at the other issues uh, that, that macroeconomists focus on, I think the one that, where there's the most disagreement is you know, what causes business cycles? Why doesn't the economy grow steadily and at an even pace? And I think there, uh, Economists are trying to explain something that's quite complex. It is disturbing that we haven't made more progress, really. Right, right. Uh, but in the case of inflation, I think you know the data have spoken. People put up four theories. They were tested by the data, and in a truly scientific way, 
one theory emerged that was more consistent with the data and, and will stay that way, I think, until something more fundamental changes about the economy. That's right. In the area of the business cycle uh, research, I think we haven't reached as much of a consensus. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Maybe, maybe it's too complex. But I think um, another area where, where there's more of a consensus emerging in macro than, than you might think is growth. I think there's a lot better understanding of what causes growth today than we had 50 or 30 years ago. And we're, we're, we're not very good at what causes development, yeah. what causes nations to escape poverty, but why rich nations get richer, we have a pretty good understanding of, I think, about the role of technology and innovation, whereas uh, in the past that wasn't as well understood. Do you think, that's, do you think that's true? I think that's true, although I'm not as certain of that as you are, and I'll tell you why. It was actually yeah. putting together the latest edition of the encyclopedia. I wanted to find someone who would do a good article on the economics of growth, the empirics of growth, how, what causes it. And I thought it was going to be straightforward. And as I, just, as I explored the literature, I found people all over the map. And I had a, an economist named Kevin Greer, whom Tyler Cowen recommended to me, do it. And his was, it was just his best honest attempt to say, what do we know and what do we not know? And it's, it was less settled than I thought. Well, that's fair. And he said that, look, we know that if you have communism, <laughs> you aren't going to have much growth. Uh, beyond that, it was, it, it, it was messy. Yeah, I guess the right, maybe the right way to think about that is the, uh, the blind man and the elephant. You know, one, one guy's got his arms around the leg and one's holding the trunk and one's got the ear and they've yeah. all focused on one aspect. You're really right. I mean, there are, there's, there's research on the relationship between religion and growth, education and growth, uh, IQ and growth, investment and, investment and growth. growth, institutions, you know, rule, yeah, rule of law, rule of law, growth. private property, right? Yeah, uh, marginal be, tax rates and growth. Correct. So, yeah. I think all those things are, some many of them are consistent with each other. They're all pieces of the same puzzle. That's yeah. that's what I mean by that elephant yeah. uh, metaphor. But, but I. It isn't as settled as, as, as I, maybe as I'd like to think. Yeah, yeah. It isn't as settled as I thought going in. Uh huh. Yeah. Going back to um, let's go back to micro now. Uh, let me challenge your view that micro is pretty settled, or, or the view that that I implied as well. And I want to take a couple of issues, either in micro or in the what we might call the interface between micro and macro, that I think used to be pretty much settled. There was a consensus. Um, you picked rent control. Yes. Rent control is an issue that politically has fallen out of fashion in most places. You don't hear a large demand uh, for uh, rent control. And a similar example would be price controls generally. I think one of the successes of economics of the last 50 years has been to highlight the dangers of, of price controls for the economy-wide price controls as a way to say, stop inflation. Yeah. And so when we get we get inflationary pressures, or when we get an individual price spike, like gasoline, like gasoline, it's it's fascinating to me how small the demand is politically for you hear it yes. for price controls. You hear it, but it doesn't have the traction it had 25 years ago. And, one and they are finding economists who will support it. Say again. Well, you're talking about how the public and how politicians view price controls, which shifts it a little off topic, because mm -hmm. we were starting to talk about how economists Correct. think of them, and economists won't typically defend them. But on the other hand, 30 years ago, economists weren't defending price controls in Correct. gasoline either. What's really shifted is the public exactly. seems to have learned something, and that's tremendous. To me, that's at least two cheers for economists for well, getting that message across. I used to feel that way, and then... In the podcast with Milton, he, he suggested that most of the changes in those attitudes is because people learn from experience that they didn't work very yeah, well. That's, that's a good and then point. when another generation comes along that hasn't had the bad experience, maybe the demand will, will re, be rekindled. Yeah. But the reason I made that, it was, it was a little confusing, the reason I made that contrast between economist perception and the public's perception is that it, it's a little easier to find areas where economists have a consensus when there's no political demand coming from the general public. Uh, so let's take the minimum wage. Yes. The minimum wage, very, just a, it's just a different form of price control. It's like right. rent control. It's like a gasoline price control. The, the analytics of it should be the same. You'd think most economists would be against it. And historically, they That's have been. been. Yes. Historically, there was an overwhelming consensus by economists that minimum wages were a bad way to fight poverty. Yes. 
but that seems to be weakening. It you is think? weakening. Now, it's weakening. But let me just point out, there's still a consensus if you look at the, the polling data. Uh, let me just mention there was a poll done in the 70s, uh, and this, the statement was a minimum wage increases employment among young and unskilled workers. Unemployment or employment? Uh, I I increases unemployment, I'm uh -huh. sorry. And 90% of economists agreed. When the poll was done in 92, 79% um, agreed. And when it was done in 2000, 74% agreed. So as you say, it's weakening, but 74% is still really high, especially when you compare it with what the public would think. I think a poll like that, and I would bet Brian Kaplan has one in his book, uh, his recent book, a poll like that would probably find that 80% of the of the public probably thinks a minimum wage is a good idea and doesn't have any effect on unemployment. But that that question didn't ask whether the minimum wage was a good idea. It asked right. whether right. it increases unemployment. increases unemployment, which is to say it asks whether demand curves slope downward or or, or whether they're vertical. Right. Uh, Does so, a price increase cause the quantity of demand to fall? Right. right. And 26% of the profession, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure how that poll defined an economist, yeah. Yeah. right? I don't know if that was a random sample of every academic economist, every working economist, whether they're in co the corporate or the union sector. But it's kind of shocking that we've yeah. now reached a point where 26% of the people polled thinks that it has no effect. As yeah. you pointed out, it could have an effect and you could it could cause unemployment. Right. But you could still be in favor of a minimum wage right. because you think that the gains to the people who keep their jobs are so large and so many of those folks are out there compared to the small effects on unemployment. But right. th those folks would say there's not even a cost of any kind, yeah, right? Yeah, well, maybe. I think the question is asked badly, by the way. That's one of my pet beefs. Because I agree. Because increases on employment is different from decreases employment. Very good point. To be counted as unemployed, you have to be out of work and looking for work. So let's say some poor, unskilled teenager loses his job because of minimum wage. He might actually get the message, there's no point in looking elsewhere. All those jobs are going to be unavailable because the minimum wage is higher. I'm not saying he thinks of it that clearly, but he might pull out, go back to school, get into the illegal sector, live with his parents, do any number of things, and he won't be counted as unemployed. And, and so maybe there are some sophisticated, maybe among those 26%, half of them had that thought. You know? I don't know. No, that's a very good point. Yes. Uh, I think that's a very good point. So let, let me sharpen okay. my, my challenge a little bit. Uh, maybe, I guess, six months ago or eight months ago, a petition came out in support of raising the minimum wage, yes. signed by I think over 500 economists, including in, Bob Solo, including Nobel Prize, a, no, a Nobel Prize winner. I think there were two or three Nobel there Prize were. winners on the list. What do you think explains that? I, I read Dan Klein in, in Economic Journal Watch did an article on it, and I, I read that, and I just. I think probing the article probed, pr probed to, why as try to get why what what was the source of their yes he he actually approval. contacted all those people and asked them and gave them a survey asked them questions and many of them cooperated and to me and I must say the biggest disappointment on that list was Bob Solo who I've always thought of as a, a quite a good economist I think ideology trumped economic thinking I think there was just this desire to go along with something that that made them feel good. That's what I think. It's hard to accept that argument. I know. I'll tell you why. Okay. I, I, I think, well, I accept half of it. I, I, think, I think you're right about ideology. Okay. Um, it, but to me, and maybe I'm being naive here, be the equivalent of a bunch of, of physicists just, you know, signing a petition that repealed gravity. I, I don't, this is such a core view. Yeah. And we have to be careful here. There's a, one piece of the minimum wage debate is its impact on employment, as you say, is the, which is the correct issue. The other is whether that's worth it. And as yes. we said earlier, you, you could certainly think it's worth it, even though it causes a reduction in employment opportunities for low-skill workers. I, I don't have that petition in front of me. I, it did, it, it hedged a little bit, but not much yeah. on, on that issue. It, it tried to suggest there was a free lunch, that this was a way to help people uh, get better without much cost. Uh, help right. poor Without people. much cost to the unemployed, to, to, those, to, to those, those unskilled folks. people as opposed yeah. to employers and consumers. Yeah, exactly. And so right. And I, I, when you say ideology trumped analysis, I think that's true, um, perhaps. Um, 
but I think the source of it wasn't a desire to feel good because there's a cost to that indulging in that feeling good. I assumed that they had a political agenda in mind of which this was one piece of a broader agenda uh -huh. and they were, they were trying to advance it. Because I think analytically, some of them would say, well, you know, uh, their justification would be, well, you know, there, there was a study by Card and Kruger right. that showed that uh, the minimum wage actually increases employment, doesn't reduce it. Yeah. Now, that's one study out of about a few hundred, a hundred right. that have all found the opposite effect. I didn't find the study persuasive methodologically, but maybe that's my ideology. And, um, it, it, but it was a strange thing. It was. Now, so when you say the political agenda, what would be the political agenda be that, that would My worry, yeah. and, and I'm going to go, um, this viewpoint makes me very uncomfortable, but let me put it on the table. My worry is that, is that ideology plays a much more active role in economics than we normally accept as economists. As economists, we like the idea that we're scientists. Right. We don't like the idea that we're ideologues whose views respond to our personal prejudices or philosophies. Maybe that's not true. M maybe economists uh, are not very scientific in many aspects, and ideology will trump analysis in many situations. That's my worry, and that the real debate in economics isn't about the elasticity of the demand for labor, that is, how responsive it is to changes in prices, but rather it is uh, between should the government get more involved or less involved. And you and I happen to be on the side of the government should be less involved than it is now. Right. Government's much more involved now than it was in the economy than it was 25 or 50 years ago in many dimensions. And yet, there are many people who think it's not involved enough, strangely enough. Yeah. And Many of those folks are economists. Uh, they're out there uh, playing roles as both uh, scientists, that is, they write research articles, but they're also out politically, actively working with, with politicians and with uh, trying to change legislation in other ways to change the role of government. Uh, I worry about what role that plays in our assessing of, of policy. Well, I guess I don't disagree. In other words, I think that, that it's, it does play a role, and I think, as you say, it plays a role on both sides. Uh, I think, I'll just put this on the table, I think I'm, even though I'm a very, very extreme libertarian, I think I'm actually better at keeping those separate than many other libertarians, and I think I'm definitely better than, than many liberal left economists. And I think part of it is, be, you know, Maybe it's just my conscience or something, but part of it is the incentives. Because I'm in a minority, I have to be very careful about this because there are so many people who will jump on me Correct. if I say something I can't justify. Just a minute ago, you said you referred to liberal left economists. Yes. Now, I've been called, and I assume you have been called also a conservative economist. Yes. I hate that. I do too. Because it implies that I'm biased. Um, I'm not a conservative either. That's a separate problem. But, uh, but then the, the sort of the subversion of that, the the other version of that is, oh, he's a free market economist. Of course, he thinks that way, as if it's yeah. a matter of religious belief. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, I don't I don't like that either. I mean, I, I I've kind of given up on that. I used to try to tell people, look, I'm an economist, and I believe in the free market. Not, I'm a free market economist. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples I used to point out was the guy who really nailed intellectually and, and, and in a scholarly way, the case for free trade, I think, in the 20th century was Paul Samuelson, who's, uh, you know, this liberal and an economist, but he was, you know, really, he just laid out just all the various cases for free trade very, very well. And so, you know, would you call Paul Samuelson a free market economist? By, their, by the standards of people, even my friends who call me that, no. And yet here he is laying out this case, this strong case for free trade. And much of his work and the work of other uh, mathematical economists who have tended to find mistakes, so-called market failures, so-called uh, cases for gov justifications for government regulation, they have uh, frequently also laid out the intellectual framework for why markets work very well. Yes. So, uh, uh, so I... It is a. It's an excellent point about Samuelson. He is a free market economist. Yeah. Politically, his he's to the left of, of, of some, yeah. uh, and it would probably identify himself politically as a liberal. Yes. But 
uh, he is a free market economist. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, um, I mean, what we're getting here is we're, we're, we're kind of peeling the onion away, the layers, and we're getting, a, a, I think, to some very difficult issues. I mean, I started by saying I think economists agree on a lot of things. I don't think anything we've said has taken me away from that. But it is true that there's less agreement than I think there should be, because for the reason you said, how much does it take to understand that when the price of something goes up, the quantity demanded goes down? The minimum wage is a price. When it goes up, the quantity demanded will go down. How could someone disagree with that? Someone could say it's a very small effect, but right. a small effect is still an effect. And so, you know, I am a little puzzled, which is why I like when I'm in those situations to really grill people one-on-one -on -one, and not in an unpleasant way, but in a pushy way to try to narrow down. Now, why do you think that? And Where do we disagree? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about trade, which yes. is another issue that, that I think historically there's been an enormous amount of consensus uh, or agreement. There still is, but I'd argue again that it has weakened. Um, do you think that's correct? Well, let me give you the data on that. That same survey I mentioned in the 70s found that 97% of economists surveyed, this was 211 economists, agreed that tariffs and import quotas reduce general economic welfare. By 1992, that was down to 92%. From 97%. From, uh, so it went from, from 97 to 92%. And in the 2000 survey, it bleeped up to about 93%. Uh -huh. So that's so pretty much remained constant, which is very, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad about that. And, uh, and again, you'd still want to know, what were those 7% thinking? I, I don't know. But still, that's, that's a, a pretty strong number. So that that's a strong number. Over 90% of economists surveyed over the last three different times over the last 25 years, 30 years, said uh, tariffs and quotas are bad. Yes. They're not good policy. I guess, the, uh, I guess some of the movement on this issue has been on the effects of trade. Whether we should intervene or not remains unpopular among economists. Interve intervention... Right. remains unpopular, but, but the welfare effects of trade maybe have gotten uh, a little less um, cheerful among economists. So an example being that I would give would be Alan Blinder. Alan Blinder's recent article, Worrying, and we discussed this briefly with uh, Ed Lehmer in a in podcast a couple weeks ago. Uh, Blinder came out with a study that said that as, as many as, really good phrase, as many as 40 million service jobs, many of them high paying, were at risk of being outsourced. And I think it was over the next 15 years. A long of time, them, yeah. a relatively long time. And but so when you do the math, which I think some people didn't do, they were shocked by that number, but you do the math and you divide 40 million, let's say it's 10 years, 40 million by 10 is 4 million jobs a year in an economy of 140 million jobs. So in other words, 3% of jobs a year, also in an economy where roughly 20% of jobs disappear every year, but they're replaced by other jobs. Yeah. And so you don't, it's not a huge, it was presented as a huge number, but it's not really a huge number. Well, I think the mental experiment people did is they said, well, if we have 140 million jobs, in 10 years we're going to have 100 million. Uh, right. right. In other words, they aren't replaced they're by They're not going to be replaced by anything. Yeah. Uh, and, one, and Blinder is famous. In fact, in my encyclopedia, he wrote the piece on free trade. He's famous for this statement that protection or, or trade barriers don't create jobs, they, they change jobs. You, you right. get different jobs. You get people specializing in the goods in which we don't have a comparative advantage rather than the goods that we do. So to, uh, you'll have more manufacturing, say, but less of other things, or within the service sector, fewer certain ser service sector jobs in one area and more in another or whatever. And so it isn't really a matter of the overall number of jobs. It's a matter of displacing jobs, or displacing particular jobs. And I think that's, uh, that's a very, very important distinction. And one of the challenges we have on both sides of the ideological spectrum is that, again, the activists, the people, whether they call themselves economists or not, who are out there pushing for a particular public policy often cheat with the data, cheat with the analysis, fudge the numbers, mm 
So we had people, when NAFTA was on the table, saying that NAFTA would create jobs, we had people saying, the proponents, yeah. we had the opponents, the people against NAFTA, saying it was going to destroy jobs, when in fact, most economists would say, as Alan Blinder did, that it would neither destroy nor create jobs, and that it would change the kind of jobs Americans did. Right, and make the jobs, on average, slightly better paying. Yeah. Slightly and, better paying. And you say slightly because Mexico is a small part, right, right. part of American economic life. It was, yes. it was treated as if somehow uh, this was going to have this enormous impact. Yeah, the impact. giant sucking sound yeah, that Ross when, Perot talked and about. And that was never likely to happen. Right, right. And in, in revising the encyclopedia, uh, which, which you've done, and, and again, the, the release date for that is scheduled for December of 2007, at, at, uh, with, published by Liberty Fund in book form, and, and after that it'll be available online in the revised uh, version. There were a whole bunch of uh, articles that, that changed. Right. There were some that were eliminated. There were right. some that were added. But among the ones that changed, tell us, Briefly, if it's possible to summarize it, first tell how over what time period are we talking about here? This revision. Okay. So, so and then, did they change in dramatic ways? Some. It, the first one I did between 1990 and 92. The second edition between 2003 and pretty much it was done by the end of 2005. It's a 15-year so, yeah, history yeah, of right, change. Yeah. You wouldn't think there'd be that much change in economics in terms of what was established fact and what wasn't. Right. You'd hope. So I'll give you one that I didn't even have a topic for in the early edition that now appears in the later edition, behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. It's a term I don't like, and so I actually had the author put in a little sentence at the front because, you know, that is what it's called, though. Yeah, but all economics is behavioral. All economics <laughs> is about human behavior. Yeah. And as my wife says, my wife, who's lived with an economist now for a quarter of a century, she gets it. And she says, people tell me my husband thinks about money. My husband analyzes money. No, he doesn't. He analyzes behavior. Yeah, and so we're all behavioral economists. But what the behavioral economists, the, the, the way the term what the term has come to mean, is people who basically think that in certain systematic ways, people will not act the way the economist model says. And so, for example, um, if you, yeah, the standard economist would say that if you give employees an option of how to invest their 401k, uh, they'll choose whatever they'll choose. If you instead chose for them and made it very low cost for them to change to something else, they would still stick with what they're given. And so they want employers, for example, to put especially young employees in more high-risk stocks because over long periods of time, stocks pay off better than bonds. Yeah, we did a podcast with Richard Thaler, who yeah. was one of the... He wrote the article. He's, well, yeah, yeah. He's, he's one of the uh, pioneers in this area, yeah. so he's in favor of that kind of uh, policy that historically most economists would say, oh, it won't matter. People just undo it. Yeah. They're rational. They'll choose the right thing either way. Thaler argues that, no, they're not rational. They, they anchor. They're, they're, they're subject to being to various behavioral biases, so-called yes. biases. Yes, and by the way, I got, I've got to admit, his evidence is so strong in some of these areas, it's very hard to disagree, even though I'd like it not to be true. I, I think much of it is. Now, what that means for overall policy is, um, I think he's starting to jump too quickly from that, and, and I guess, uh, did he do something with Cass Sunstein on this? Yes, on, he did. Yeah, libertarian paternalism yes, or something. Correct. And it's and not that libertarian. Was, <laughs> yeah, that was, the sort of, we, yeah. that was the topic of the podcast. And yeah. Ed Glazer, we also did a podcast with Ed, who's a big critic of this, says yeah. it's a bad idea, and as many yeah. uh, so-called libertarians are. Uh, they don't find libertarian paternalism a... Uh, they think it's an oxymoron, and Sunstein and Thaler claim it's not. But. Yes, and there was actually a very good blog back and forth on the Wall Street Journal website on that, which I thought the anti-paternalist won. Um, and so, it, anyway, the point is it's, it, it's very hard to get from their, I think, correct views about the limits of economics in, a, in understanding all behavior. It's hard to get from that to saying a government should do these things, especially when you consider that those same people who are so irrational are running the government. Yeah, no, they and don't now have... they're dealing with other people's money, not their own. So you've got irrational, irrationality plus I don't care very much, and somehow you're going to get a better result. Yeah, no, I'm a skeptic as you are on that. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but the, the increase in what, what is called behavioral economics, the phenomenon, is a challenge to the worldview that, that uh, again, analytically, forget the policy for a moment, that's a case where economics 
perhaps has has changed. Yes. And, and there is much less consensus about uh, the reliability of the rational actor model, et cetera. Right. right. Um, what else? Any other examples that are dramatic in the encyclopedia where something, uh, an article, had to sort of change its viewpoint because well, scientific evidence had changed? Uh, sometimes it was a matter of, and it's not so much certain things had changed, but there was a matter of backfilling and saying, oh my goodness, we forgot that. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the article on information by Joe Stiglitz handled some of the areas very well. But what I had wanted from him and just could never get him to uh, was to talk about how prices convey information mm -hmm. and the whole idea from Friedrich Hayek that just the power of prices in directing behavior in a socially beneficial way. So I had Don Boudreau, whom you know very well, have a, do a piece on information and prices that just laid this out really beautifully. And that's an interesting silo problem. The people who've done the pioneering work on information in the last 25 years tend to be less interested or feel it's already established this role of prices, the Hayekian role of prices, and uh, they're just not as interested in it, or they don't, they're not as persuaded by it. I don't know which it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then some of the others, um, I wish I had thought more about this, because I know there are some where I'll just be driving along and I'll think, I am so glad I got that article. It's so much better than what it replaced. And there were probably five to ten of those where there was just a dramatic improvement. It was either yeah, an author who improved it or, or a different author, you know, um, but, but, but they're not coming to me offhand. But as far as kind of reflecting major changes in thinking of the profession, well, okay, education. There's just been a lot that economists have learned about the economics of education, both K through 12 and, and higher education. So I have a much more, compl I just had an article on public schools in the first one, just on public schools. I didn't do education. So I, this author, Linda Gorman, did the whole education thing and, and just laid out, there's just so much evidence now on things like vouchers, does this class size matter, um, all those kinds of things, and so that's it's just loaded with evidence. Yeah, so that's, that's an a, area. Yeah, that's an area where there's just been more research done, I yeah. think, and it's 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 been an area of much greater focus. Right. Over the last fifteen years. Right. Um, so you think that an encyclopedia of economics is a meaningful idea? I assume, don't you? I, I do. Right. Which <laughs> I, that's why I've invested roughly two years <laughs> in the early '90s and roughly two years in the early 2000s into that, and let me just tell you a story that it was the first time I had the thought about an encyclopedia of economics. I was with Martin Feldstein's economist, uh, Council of Economic Advisors, and I was, I came on board. Which, is, which was roughly when? Which was 82 to 84. Okay. I came in two weeks before he came in. He inherited me from Murray Wiedenbaum, who'd actually hired me, but then Marty renewed me for a year because he liked my work in 83, so I was there two years. My first year, Two of my colleagues whom Marty brought in were Larry Summers, Lawrence Summers, and Paul Krugman. And sometimes, not often, but sometimes the economists would go for lunch and mix it up a little on the issues. So you'd have people like Ben Zyker, Lincoln Anderson, and me, who were all very strong believers in free market and less government. And you'd have Larry Summers, who wanted more of an active role for government, and Paul Krugman, who wanted, I think, even more of an active role. But when we would actually talk about the issues, what was really striking was what we didn't disagree on. You know, things like free trade, things like price controls. Larry actually trimmed around the edges on natural gas, but never, I don't even, I'm not even sure he convinced himself. I think he might have been playing devil's advocate. Because uh, people were talking about eliminating natural gas price controls then, and in fact they did, and, and we had good results from that. And so I remember after about the th third of these lunches, I thought, you know what, this is more of a science than I had thought. And it harkened back to when I went into the Council of Economic Advisors as a summer intern in 73 under Herb Stein, and Sam Peltzman was one of the people who recommended me for the job. He was a professor of mine at UCLA. And be just before I applied for that position, we were in an industrial organization class Sam was teaching at UCLA. And I was all excited about this economist statement I'd read against natural gas price controls. And I said to, said it to Sam, and Sam said, ah, 
big deal. 95% of economists oppose price controls on natural gas. And I thought, they do? I mean, this would, and I think Sam overstated, but Sam was getting at a real point, which uh -huh. is there is all this agreement. He said, Dave, when you get, David, when you get to the Council of Economic Advisors, when you get a chance, go through some old memos from the Johnson administration where you have senior economists writing these things. And I, it was hard to get access to that, but to the extent I did, I found that what he was saying was true. If you'd asked a, an economist in the Johnson administration, should we get rid of natural gas price controls, the answer absolutely would have been yes. And here's the other thing, here's what I want, the point I want to make, is that when economists get into positions where they really need to focus on, on the on the on the real issue at hand, whereas the old cliche goes, the rubber meets the road. I mean, okay, I've said all these things for ideological reasons or whatever, but I've got a chance to push this little button that changes the probability one way or the other of, this, of a particular policy. Which button do I push? They tend to push the button that says, let's deregulate, let's not regulate more, et cetera. And, and I, I have a quote in the introduction of my encyclopedia. Do I have time for a sure. brief oh, version yeah. of the quote? Read a long one. We've this was a, this was Steve Kelman, who was a, a very sharp guy, a budget official in the Carter administration, and he was expressing his upset with economists. And he's later in the Clinton administration. He said, the lawyers are often exasperated. He's a lawyer by training, I believe. Not only by the frequency with which agency economists, in other words, economists within the particular agency he was in, attacked their proposals, but also by the unanimity among the agency economists in their opposition. The lawyers tend to incorrectly attribute this opposition to failure to hire, quote, a broad enough spectrum, unquote, of economists, and to beg the economists, if they can't support the lawyers' proposals, at least to give them, quote, the best economic arguments, unquote, in favor of them. The economist's answer is typically something like, quote, there are no good economic arguments for your proposal, unquote, which, by the way, is sometimes stronger than I would say. Yeah, I mean, sure. there might be good economic arguments, they just aren't good enough. Right, they don't but, uh, so, so I found that very striking. And it was things like, and I read this well after I'd done actually both versions of the encyclopedia, but it, I was picking up that sense when I was in Washington. And then one much earlier story, David Friedman once told me this story. He was talking about his father. And his father, Paul Douglas, who was a liberal senator from Illinois, who used to be on the faculty of the University of Chicago, he was a colleague of Milton's. They I barely overlapped before he became a senator. He's famous for the Cobb-Douglas function. as his, yes. his most famous contribution to economics literature, which is a way of modeling the relationship between capital, labor, and output. Right. And, and so he was... Then he was, became a senator. Yeah, he became a senator from Illinois. Very liberal senator, voted very liberal. Um, he was in, I think he might have been head of the Joint Economic Committee, the Senate person who who's, has that position. And Milton Friedman would come to Washington to testify before the Joint Economic Committee. And David told me what would typically happen is you'd have various other people testifying and you'd have various senators talking. And within a few minutes, it was just this dialogue between Paul Douglas and Milton Friedman. They were agreeing that everything those other people were saying made no sense. <laughs> and, and, and the way Milton once put it is, you, you, start a, you have a room full of, uh, of non-economists and economists of various ideological stripes, and what you will find very quickly is on a particular issue about the effects of something, not about whether you should do something, but about the effects the of something, thing. you will typically find all the economists lined up on one side and all the non-economists on the other. And I see this with so-called conservatives who, when, when someone will say, hey, let's reduce the amount of carbon usage by having a tax on carbon, and the, the non-economist conservative will sometimes say, oh, that'll have no effect. People will drive the same amount. People will use the same amount of fuel. And Every economist I know, no matter whether he thinks the carbon tax is a good or bad idea, agrees that it will reduce the amount used. Right. Yeah, that's, um, there's the one case, I think, where, where behavioral economics has not made much of an inroad. Yes. It, it, the recent run-up over the last year or so of gas prices drives me nuts because people say, yeah, well, when it hits $4, that's when people will start driving less. And what... What they misunderstand is that part of the reason the price is going up is that demand is increasing. So you're going to see a positive association between prices and driving. It's yes. the increase in driving that's pushing up the prices. That doesn't refute the law of demand. Uh, 
and yet in, in the public's mind and in the pundit's minds, uh, you often read that you know, people just keep driving, no matter what the price, as if a tax, say, on gasoline, yes. uh, exogenous imposed on the outside would reduce the amount of driving. It would. It might yeah. not reduce it a lot. It might not produce it, reduce it by the same percentage change as the price change. But there you're right. There's an overwhelming agreement, I think, in most cases, the minimum wage is slightly different maybe, but yeah. in most cases that people do respond to incentives. And everyone, pretty much all economists agree that if the tax, say, remains in place a long time, people respond even more. Yeah. So now thing. I'm not going to go out and buy, well, actually, I have a Honda Civic, but, but if I had an SUV and there's a tax and it's a temporary tax, I'm going to respond appropriately. If it's a long-term tax, the next time it comes to replace my vehicle, I'm going to get a different vehicle. And by the way, it might somewhat speed up the, the speed at which I replace the vehicle. Right, exactly. Well, I think that's a cheerful note to end on, but I'm not going to end on that cheerful note. I want to raise one more issue okay. of, of disagreement potentially between us on this consensus. I think this would be easy to prove. I, I don't have any explicit numbers to prove it, but I think it'd be easy to prove that uh, economists have, have more opportunities in the marketplace than they had 25 years ago. There are more ways for economists to make money using economics, and the returns to being an economist are higher. Uh, I know the returns to a PhD are higher in America than they were 25 years ago, and, I, and I'm, I'm very confident that economics PhDs have, have done very well economically. But they haven't just done well economically. It isn't just that college professors with a PhD in economics make more than they did 25, 30 years ago. The range of stuff you can do for money as an economist has expanded. There are more think tanks. There are more media outlets. There are more economists writing now than ever before. Some of us are writing f for free, or close to free, uh, or at least no explicit monetary payment in the blogosphere. Uh, others are writing columns for the New York Times or the Washington Post, or they're on the nightly news doing commentary or on NPR. Economists, I would argue today, have more opportunities to run their mouth and their pen and their keyboard than they had 25 years ago, and they pay better. And I would argue that that has changed our willingness to use data honestly. I would argue that's created some unhealthy incentives for people to... Um, segregate themselves by, say, ideology and hold views that are perhaps not as, as scientific as we held in the past. My favorite example is that Paul Krugman in the Sunday New York Times Magazine uh. wrote an article saying that if we took money away from the rich and gave it to the poor, the poor would have more and the rich would have less. It's simple arithmetic, uh, implying that the world is a zero-sum game, yes. uh, which is to me a, a the zero-sum game view of the world uh, that everyone's gain must come at someone's expense is perhaps the biggest fallacy that it prevents economic understanding. Here is a Ivy League economist coming out in the most prestigious media outlet uh, that there is saying that wealth is a zero-sum game. <clears throat> so I thought uh, that was a wake-up call for me, that something yeah. had changed. Yeah. And I think we see that kind of thing in print and in coming out of think tanks uh, not only that you and I work for, of course, uh, but but uh, I hope, but but that's a real problem, I think, in the profession. I, I do. I think when I was wondering who's your example going to be, and, and I think you gave the very best example. The way I put it is that when Paul Krugman started writing for the New York Times, when, when he used to write for things like Slate and other things, I'd read most of his articles, and I found myself informed in a positive way at least seventy percent of the time. Now it's I used to say it's under 20. Now I think it's under 10%. Now, I don't course, want to pick on, on yeah, Krugman. I don't think he's an he's... extreme example because he was so good at expressing economics for a general audience. His book, Pop Internationalism, Fantastic is book. one of the best books ever written in trade, bar none. Yep. And it's it, a great book. It, it, but even, and it competes with the choice, your book. Yeah, that's fine. And, I like competition. Yeah, and right. And, it's stunning to me that the same person could have written that as writes these New York Times articles. Another one he, he gets wrong a lot is on, on, on health care. Now, I don't mean he gets it wrong because he advocates a policy I don't favor. He does advocate a policy I don't favor, namely he wants more government involvement. But he doesn't write like an economist when he's writing on it. He never talks about, well, when the price is set at zero, do you think maybe more people will want more health care? He never addresses that. It's just this wonder world he builds 
And it, it, it is extreme, I think, in that sense. And I, I think, I don't think he's, I know he's not the only one. And I, I think these opportunities we have now to, to use our uh, brand name, our uh, credentials as economists to reach broader audiences than we did 25 years ago. I mean, so I think it's a wonderful thing. It's certainly yes. beneficial to us as economists. It's a, yeah. it's lovely to have more options, but I think it has uh, it's changed the way economists look at the world in their public pronouncements. Yeah, and yet, I mean, and you might not want to go there, but can you think of anyone who's very free market oriented who's done the same thing? And you might not want to. Yeah, name. I don't want to go there, I okay. and I didn't really want to go to okay. pick on Krugman. Okay. Um, but but we'll go. Let's go back uh, okay. in the seventies. There were two economists who made money staking out ideologically uh, extreme positions. John Kenneth Galbraith. Well, actually, I was oh. thinking of Paul Samuelson okay. and Milton Friedman writing in Newsweek. Okay. Th those were the two people right. who had a public soapbox. Right. And as you pointed out earlier, they were on different sides of the political spectrum. Everyone understood that. Yeah. Uh, but the, mar the market was thin. There yes, weren't a lot of choices for people who wanted to reach a popular audience. Today, that opportunity is much, much wider. And I just, I, I'm just speculating here. I'm not, I don't think this is a social problem or a, a crisis, but I wonder if it has affected the way, um, the way our profession works. For example, if you and I were talking about um, climatologists, yes. we would be aware of the fact, as economists who, are, who understand incentives, that the political environment which hands out grants and money and prestige based on where you fit in the political spectrum could affect the scientific work done on climate right. by, by so-called scientists. Right. And I don't know about you, but I'm skeptical because I know that the pr of some of that work, I'm not saying it's wrong or it's all biased, but I wouldn't expect that that money, that enormous pool of money that's now at stake, would have no effect on the quality of the science. I expect right. it, it might have an effect. Yes. True? Oh, definitely, I think. And, and then why would economists be so distinct in that sense, I think is the implicit question. And, and the answer is they wouldn't be. And so, so, so you will have some movement in that direction. I'm hoping it's a marginal movement. In other words, I'm hoping that there'll be some people who will abuse it in that way and that the vast majority won't, but I don't necessarily have a basis for that hope. Yeah, the, the claim here that I'm pushing, which, I, which I, again, I'm just speculating here, is not so much that people make money by being biased, but that there's a return now in economics to being provocative. Yes. Uh, people aren't interested yeah. in the, on the one hand, on the other hand. Yeah. You don't get in the yeah. New York Times, you don't, you don't have a very successful blog yeah. if you just sort of write uh, uh, in a, in a wishy-washy way or in a thoughtful way, you you make a name for yourself by being outrageous, dramatic, yeah. extreme. Or uh, picking the pet issue of the day and, and going for that, even if the bigger context is very different. I'll give you an example. I did a piece in the Wall Street Journal in January after Arnold Schwarzenegger's health plan came out in which I really went after it. And one of the just throwaway lines, it was a true statement, it wasn't necessarily the most important statement in the piece, but I said that from my understanding of the proposal as I had looked at it, you'd have illegal aliens qualifying for a lot of these free benefits. I got a call that day from the booker for O'Reilly, and that was what he wanted to focus on. He wanted you to, to rile people up, to pardon the phrase, yeah. O'Reilly wanted to rile people up about illegal aliens because that's his... His audience is, is, is unfortunately has, I think, a large xenophobic, yes. anti-immigrant. Uh, people like yeah. enjoying being anti-immigrant. Yeah, and, and I didn't turn it down for that reason. It was I had, I, had a, <laughs> I had made a commitment that day to give a speech, and I wasn't going to break my commitment. But if I'd gone on, I would have done everything I could to shift it from that. You know, but sur surely that would have been probably a bigger part of my little five-minute segment than I would have wanted. Right, it's an interesting example. Yeah. And the thing is, think of my incentive then. What if I'd played along and I'd spent the whole five minutes saying, yeah, this is a big problem, and just going into all the aspects of illegal immigration, because I can find many bad aspects of illegal immigration, but that doesn't mean overall it's really bad. Let's say I'd done that, I'd get booked more often on O'Reilly. Sure. You know, and but then the question, of course, for me is, 
why do I want to be booked to say something that I don't want to say? And the answer <laughs> is to make to make money because it would enhance yeah. your reputation, yeah. your name, and surely many people right. find that uh, appealing. Yeah. Just as a, a digression, because I think it's an, it's somewhat related. It's intellectually related to me anyway. Uh, uh, sports is an area where there's a lot more money than there was 25 years ago. Yeah. And I think people romanticize uh, sports and have trouble accepting the fact that when there's an enormous amount of money at stake, people are going to take steroids, they're going to take human growth hormone, yeah. they're going to do all kinds of things that we predict as economists they would do. And people have this romantic idea that sports is like it is on the playground when everybody's out having a good time and it's, the, you know, it's this beautiful, uh, idyllic game. Yeah. And it's a business, and it's a remarkably lucrative business for the participants, and people respond to incentives. And we can't, college football will never be the way it was in 1930, or 1960 even, yeah. because the amount of money that's washing around there. But people want it. They want both. Yeah. They want to love the game, follow it intensely, and they want it to follow a bunch of rules that it can't, can't be enforced, or that can't really effectively be enforced. Yeah. And I think what I'm saying about economists is I want to make, sure people understand what I'm saying. I think it's great that economists have more opportunities now, obviously, uh, to, to use the tools of economics, but you got to take what people say with a grain of salt. Yes. So, you know, my punchline for our conversation is that I, I think there is a lot of consensus in economics, but there's a lot of bad economics out there and bad policy, and uh, one has to be as, as um, uh, careful and, and skeptical as always. Um, so you want to add anything at, at, or close? Well, I, I want to say amen to that and also just say that what I, I hope people don't walk away from hearing this thinking is that old line, it's kind of the equivalent of there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. You know, that I've, I sometimes when I talk about this in class and I lay out what this economist said was wrong and that one said was wrong and my students see it, they say, well, professor, what, what media source can I trust? Is there one media source I should listen to? And I thought really hard about that and said, no. You've not. got to triangulate. You've got to see what Fox is saying. You've got to see what MSNBC is saying. You've got to see what the New York Times is saying. And you've got to see so even so, a little of the academic literature. And it's, it's hard. You can't just take it at face value and at the same time don't put so much salt on it that you've got nothing. Yeah, I mean, journalists that I've talked to are the same way. They want to know who are the good economists, who are the true, who are the truth tellers. And the answer is, there's no simple answer. You, you can't, yeah. what's, the, what's the right assessment of, you name it, health care, minimum wage, uh, trade issues? And the answer is, you got to pick and choose. Like you say, you, you, yeah. you got to use your own head. Yeah. You can't just follow what one person says must always be true, because it's not necessarily the That's case. That's right. That's right. Um, is it different in physics? Milton Friedman said that once he was at a table, some kind of banquet, this was in the 50s or 60s, and he, and he, he I guess, been facing this issue in economics, people saying it's all a bunch of opinion, and he said to this physicist, this relatively well-known physicist sitting beside him, you know, do you guys fight that way about all these things and do personal things enter and, 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 and do people disagree on some what seem like really basic things? And the guy said, of course we do. Yeah, no, they do. They do. Right. We, we romanticize the hard sciences as if there's, yeah. there's no debate. It just progress and truth just march forward inexorably every week, right? But that's not true. Right. It's kind of the equivalent of looking at the founding fathers and seeing all these people remind you of your favorite grandfather because of the color of their wigs or whatever, <laughs> and saying, oh, they are the, all the nicest people in the world, and they all got together and agreed on everything, yeah. whereas they're hammering it out of <laughs> how strong a central government, you know, should we have a central government, all that stuff. And their political campaigns uh, yeah. that followed against each other were not always as oh. pleasant as you might yeah. Hope or think. Yeah. Well, my guest today has been David Henderson, research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, professor of economics at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, author of The Joy of Freedom, and as I've, we mentioned and discussed, he's the editor of the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics, which will be coming out in its revised form in December of 2007. You'll be able to find it at the Library of Economics and Liberty online shortly thereafter. David, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Russ. Thank you.
This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.